introducer. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in the series, uh, Teaching Fellows series on the arts. And uh, tonight we have uh, Mike Drizik, who is a um, jewelry designer, manufacturer, and repairer. I guess you do it all, don't you? Um, Mike got involved in jewelry first when he was in high school in uh, Park Forest, Illinois. Uh, it began as a hobby and uh, has now become a full-time occupation. He's taken uh, gemstone courses through uh, various programs and uh, attended the Great Lakes Jewelers Institute uh, since 1993, which I guess is about the time you went at it full time, started going at it full time. He's participated in several juried art shows in Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan, and, uh, where he's won several awards. Um, he does goldsmithing, silversmithing, platinum work, diamond and gemstone setting, lapidary work, lost wax carving and casting, diamond and fine jewelry appraisals. He also teaches classes in silversmithing and jewelry buying. He and his wife, Vicki, who's seated right there, are the owner and proprietors of Oak Ridge, Ridge Studio in Wheatfield. Um, jeweler, uh, Mike's a jeweler and Vicki's a basket maker. So, um, Mike is also a board member of the Prairie Arts Council. And I guess that's it. Please welcome Mike Drizik. Well, thank you, Bob. Now that you've introduced me and talked about myself, I don't have much to say about myself. I was going to start off with that. I still am. Um, I guess most people like to learn how an artist gets involved in the arts, where they started, how they got their interest in it. Um, my interest in jewelry started at a very young age. Um, I was one of those kids that came home with rocks in my pocket all the time. You know, it was constantly going out and picking up rocks. I used to live adjacent to a forest preserve also, so this even then made it more advantageous for my love of nature and love of going out and finding gemstones, what I thought were gemstones at the time at least. They were gemstones to me. Um, one of the things that really got me where I learned a lot about the trade, or a lot about gemstones, was as a kid collecting rocks, I was cutting through a neighbor's yard one time and uh, he had a bird bath and it was made out of stones. Well, here I was, maybe seven or eight at the time, and I'm trying to pry these stones off this bird bath because I saw one that looked really nice. And all of a sudden, I look up in the window, and here's this guy looking out at me, and he's got this big smile on his face. I'm going, I'm scared, thinking he's going to come out and holler at me. And instead, he comes out, and he starts talking to me. He says, why were you taking that stone out of there? I said, it looked pretty. I says, you know, I knew you had a bunch of them on there, and I didn't think you'd miss a couple of them off of there. So he started laughing, and he started talking to me about it, and he says, you're interested in gemstones and rocks. I go, yeah, I am. Well, I come to find out this man was a geologist, retired. Uh, he sort of like took me on as a, like an apprentice to him. He loved this. He had this little kid in the neighborhood that he could teach about rocks and gems. And it was very interesting. Mr. Corley was somebody who was very instrumental in teaching me a lot at a young age. Uh, he taught geology. I can't remember what school it was now. Um, it was out in Colorado, though. One of the major uh, universities. might have been the University of Colorado where he taught geology. So he was very... Uh, well-educated on gemstones also, which was a hobby of his. He collected gemstones. So at that point, at a young age, I, got, I learned a lot about the trade as far as the gemstones go and the, the rocks and minerals. Uh, from there, my father saw that I had an interest in this too. So he worked for a Northern Illinois gas company. Uh, he had friends in the gas company who were, who were geologists also. He used to bring me home core samples. Here I was, eight, nine years old, and you go into my bedroom, and I got core samples that have been taken from all these different drilling sites. Why I had them and what I used them for, I don't know. It was just a look at. They had markings on them, which didn't mean anything to me. Still, I had them. I found one of them not too long ago, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And then I put two and two together, what this core sample was and where I had gotten it from. It was nice because my father used to do a lot of field work um, out in, where they're installing pipes and stuff. Well, sure enough, he'd be looking around the ground trying to find me rocks, too, and all the time. So, he was constantly coming home and bringing me rocks. When I went to high school, as Bob mentioned, uh, is where I learned about jewelry. I was very lucky. Uh, the high school I attended, Rich East High School in Park Forest, Illinois, had an excellent art program at the time. Um, it was the early 70s. There was a lot of money available for the arts at that time. And our jewelry program was 
basically a college level jewelry course that they taught. Um, we had jewelry one, jewelry two, and jewelry three. You could take it for three semesters if you wished. And they had different aspects of the jewelry at that time. And we were casting jewelry freshman, sophomore year. And this is something that most jewelers don't even do. Uh, the lost wax method of casting is basically you're making a wax duplicate. You put it in a fireproof plaster, you burn out the wax, and therefore you have a perfect uh, silhouette of what you've made in wax. You pour the gold in or silver you know, that you're using on it. Uh, the nice thing about this was that there was so much money available for the arts at that time that we, had, we even had art shows for the South Suburban High Schools in Illinois, which was, I can remember some of the art shows they did in the Park Forest Plaza where there would be over a hundred different exhibitors. And these were just high school kids who had applied the arts at that time and just had so much available to them that they could make so many different things. And they made it available at the art shows, these art shows available to all the high school students. Um, they had a lot of juried shows. Uh, one of the juried shows that uh, a teacher coaxed me into entering at one time was for the South Suburban High Schools. What I did is I just said, well, okay, I'll just enter a couple of pieces into it. And I won some awards on that. And I didn't think much about it at the time. She said that I had won three blue ribbons. And I said, well, okay, that's nice. I won three blue ribbons for my jewelry. But I didn't find out until later on that there was only seven blue ribbons issued for over, uh, let's see, it was 40 different high schools. And at, at that point, I realized, wow, these things must be something. Well, they sent my pieces on to New York. I had to sign a waiver releasing it to this uh, national agency that wanted my jewelry pieces. But I never heard any more about it, and I didn't win any further than that. So where it went from there, I, I don't know. But that really sparked my interest in wanting to make jewelry. Um, I mean, you win an award like that you know, at a young age. You just figure, well, I must be, be able to do this pretty good. So I took it upon myself. I've always been a craftsman. I was always more the type of person who liked to make things. Um, I wasn't really into drawing or painting that much. I, I did a little bit of it, but my love was to make things, to create things. Um, I was one of those kids that liked to build things. So this just came naturally. Here I had two things that I, I liked. I liked to make things, and I had an interest in gemstones. Uh, put the two and two together, you know, here's a hobby that it, you know, most people don't get to do. Uh, it was pretty lucky to like I say, to learn all those things. And the, the luckiest part was having the teachers there who were so good at what they did. Um, a few of the teachers actually left and became professional artists. Uh, they made a living at it. And one of, them, the, one of my mentors, a pottery teacher, he actually still does it for a living. That's all he does is sell pottery and do the art shows. He was somebody who was instrumental in a lot of my designing. Um, I had a jewelry teacher who taught me the mechanics of making jewelry, but it was my pottery teacher who really taught me how to design things and how to apply different techniques and different materials. Uh, the things I like to work with are not the things that make me money. Uh, the pieces I like to make with, I have a few of them up here made out of wood. Uh, I usually like to combine different materials, things that aren't naturally seen in jewelry. I like the contrast of color, the contrast of textures. And it's very easy to use with wood and some of the other things, that use, some of the other metals I use. Got to go back over my notes here. Maybe I should get my glasses so I can see what I've written. Uh, skip the page. There we go. And like I said, after at the end of high school, um, because I had won those awards, I had a partial scholarship to the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, I went down for an orientation, and at that time, the Art Institute is still a little bit like this. It's, um, it's very upper crust, I guess would be the easiest way to put it. And when I went down to the orientation itself, I, I didn't like the school and the way it was uh, people were approaching me in the school, so I chose not to go. Uh, I chose to get a job in a lumber yard. <laughs> at that time, I mean, uh, at that time in my life, uh, getting a good union job, I was coming into a job making more money than most of my friends who had gone to college were making. So I'd seen it as being advantageous to me to take a job where I was going to make a decent living. And I still made jewelry on the side. I, uh, I made jewelry at home for friends, uh, neighbors. I repaired their jewelry for them. They'd bring it by for me. But other than that, I just kept it up as a hobby. Um, then, by an accident that I had at work, I basically got thrown into this business. Uh, I hurt my back at a, the job I worked at in the lumber yard. The doctor says, you're not picking anything heavy up anymore. So what are you going to do? This was something very easy to fall back on. Um, it was a trade that I could get into because I had had experience in it that I'd learned in high school. 
This is one of those things that I keep on trying to stress to a lot of people why the arts are so important in school. There's little things that people don't think that they're, the arts are something for the side. There's something for people to do, you know, for their spare time. It's not really academics like the other programs are that they're going to be able to make a living on. Well, a lot of people can make the livings on the, on the arts. Uh, in this case, it really helped me out because it was something else I could do. Uh, I had a lucky experience with an insurance company. Uh, I, through my workers' comp insurance, one of the people who was there was trying to help me find work. And he found me an apprenticeship with a jeweler. Apprenticeships are very hard to come by. Um, the jewelry trade, as it has been throughout history, is a very close-knit, tight trade. They don't like to share their secrets. They want to keep them to themselves. Um, I can remember as a kid seeing this little old man in the back room who used to repair jewelry. Well, that's the way it used to be, and all these little old men have retired now, and they never trained anybody because they didn't have children. There's a very big shortage right now of bench jewelers. Um, they can command a very good wage right now because there's such a big shortage. It's like because the trade was so secretive, all these guys never passed this down, and there's very few people who wanted to learn it at the time. And now, because of the influx of jewelry stores and the in influx of jewelry sales, there's a big shortage of bench jewelers, people who do my work. I'm considered a bench jeweler. Uh, a bench jeweler refers to the bench that I work at. I'm the guy that sits in the back room who makes everything look pretty. So the guy in a suit can come out and show it to you. You know, look what we did for you. And then, oh, you're such a good guy, you know. And we're in the back room looking through the window to see how the, the customer likes it. It's, I like it, though. I like the area that I'm in. Um, it's nice because my job is so different every day. Uh, being in the repair business and in setting business and doing custom work, I have a different uh, schedule every day. Uh, I can, can do something completely different day to day. I work on pieces that are different challenges day to day. So my job, it keeps my job very interesting. And then I actually like what I do. It's, it's fun. To me, it's a challenge when I get a piece of jewelry and some, somebody has brought to me that another jeweler can't fix or can't repair. It, to me, it's a challenge. Well, let me see what I can do for this, see if I can repair it. And luckily enough, I had good training back in high school and being taken on at this apprenticeship um, even being taken on at this apprenticeship, it was hard to get my teacher to teach me things. He only wanted to teach me a limited amount of things. He wanted to teach me what I needed to know. This is what you have to know. This is what you do in my shop. Uh, most jewelry shops are set up where there's individuals who do certain specific jobs. Um, one guy might just be a stone setter. The only thing he'll do is set stones in rings. Uh, another man might be a, a ring sizer. All he'll do is size rings in the shop. Uh, my job was chain repair and bracelet repair. From there, I went into stone setting and learning the other applications. There's, like I say, there's a lot of tricks of the trade that take a long time to learn. Um, I'm still learning. I'm one of those, this is one of those trades that you never stop learning because there's new materials entered every year. There's new designs every year. Uh, there's new cuts of stones. So even a jeweler who's been in the business for 20, 30 years it's still going to have to learn new techniques, new materials, and new tools. You constantly have to update yourself on this. Uh, the fun thing about the jewelry, that, or I should say the fun thing, the one thing that really helped me out with making the jewelry was when I did hurt my back, I, uh, I had this downtime where I couldn't do anything for almost a year and a half. Well, here I go back down in the basement with all my jewelry and started making it again. Uh, there again, here's an art program that helped me out because I was limited to what I could do. I was used to doing outdoor activities, and all of a sudden I couldn't do any of that anymore. Um, the jewelry really helped me out. It was almost like a therapy. It was something to do to keep myself occupied. There's a lot of art programs that people will get involved with that they pick up later on after they retire. And it's good. I mean, they're, very, they're good for a lot of people because a lot of people retire from their jobs and they don't know what to do. If they have these art programs behind them and some of these other things that they learn in the arts, it's something to pick up later on. It's, like, I don't know how much I can stress the importance of the arts to overall in society as to how valuable they are. Uh, one of the other things that happened to me, uh, just to briefly go back, I had gotten a job one time in the lumberyard and I was laid off. Um, I went to work for a plumber. And this guy asked me when he hired me, he says, do you know how to solder? Well, I said, well, yeah, I know how to solder. I learned how to solder in high school. I'm not going to say anything else to him about it. So I get to the job site and he whips out these blueprints and here's all this piping laying around. He says, well, get as much done as you can. Goodbye. So here I am stuck at a job I've never done before and I figured it out. I put two and two together. I just applied my jewelry techniques on a larger scale. Okay, you've got to cut copper tubing in length. You follow the blueprints like you're making a model. 
Well, he comes back to the job and he says, oh, you did a pretty good job. He says, how long have you been doing this? I said, I've never done it before in my life. And he looked at me and he goes, what do you mean you've never done it before? I says, I've never done this before. I said, I've made jewelry. I said, that's where I learned how to solder. You didn't ask me specifically. And I said, I was so scared about losing the job if I told you I didn't know what I was doing. that I figured, well, let me just fake it here and see what I can do. It was another thing with it, uh, that I had learned in arts that I could applied and transferred over to another job. It's just one of those things I just thought of at the last minute here as I was talking, and I thought I'd refer to it. Well, when Bob asked me to do this class, I was a little apprehensive because I've, I don't really consider myself a good public speaker. Uh, I, I actually flunked my speech class in high school when I think about it now. I had to take it over again because I was so nervous about talking to people. But I, I wanted to take this class because in this trade, one of the things that I've learned is that the consumers really don't know a lot about buying jewelry. Uh, when customers come in, I like to be able to talk to them. When they come with a problem, uh, just talking to them, I can find out and I can relate to them about the materials and what I'm doing. And they really don't have that much knowledge about it. And I really started watching the jewelers. I'm a person who wants to learn his business, so I learn by watching. I learn by watching the other jewelers. And it's, it's funny, it's almost like the jewelers don't want people to know. They really don't want them to learn about the gemstone trade. They don't want them to learn about metals. They, they like to keep you in the dark. They, they really do. And I sort of look at it this way. I mean, if you go and buy a car, you're going to want to know about the car. You're going to know what size engine it has in it. You want to know the mileage. You want to know everything about it, the different aspects of it. Is it rust proof? You go in as an educated consumer buying a car. It's a big investment. Um, buying jewelry is a big investment. And it's amazing that how many people don't really know what they're buying. They're going in blindly trusting the jewelers who are selling them their goods. I'm not going to say that the jewelers are dishonest, but it's a sales technique. Uh, let them know as much as they need to know. Leave it at that. They don't really want to teach you everything because then you're going to be able to figure out and calculate what's being done here. What am I paying for? Why am I paying a lot more for this item? Because I know now what they're selling me. So it, it's, it's really... It's been advantageous to me in my business. When a customer comes in and buying a bridal set, I sit them down and I'll educate them on diamonds. It's, it's worked out very well for me because when I educate a person about diamonds, they know what they're buying. I can go to that person and I say, this is what I'm going to give you for a price range that you're looking for. And I send them shopping. I literally send them to other stores. And I'd love to hear the replies that come back. I hear people coming back saying, you know, I asked this guy in the jewelry store exactly what you said about what great a diamond they asked for. He didn't know what I was talking about. This guy in the jewelry store didn't understand this. And it's, it's funny to see these, these consumers going into jewelry stores and talking to, quote, professionals in the business who don't know anything about it. Um, there's very few people in the jewelry business now today who know a lot about gemstones and jewelry. They know how to sell. They're salespeople. That's all they're there for. Uh, most of the jewelry stores have gotten to the point they don't, they don't do any work anymore. Um, it, take, for instance, South Lake Mall. Uh, I used to work for a wholesale outlet that did the repairs for South Lake Mall. South Lake Mall doesn't have any bench jewelers at it. They never used to have any. They, one store is starting to get some in. Uh, they sent all the work to us. All the stores, J.C. Penney's, Fox's, Osterman's, it all went out to another wholesale repair place because they didn't have anybody in the stores who did the work anymore. Um, none of the stone setting itself is, is done in shops anymore or in the stores. That's the way it used to be. Turn of the century, if you went into a jewelry store, you had one guy there. He got the gold, he got the stones, he made the rings from scratch. You don't find that anymore. There's very few people out there who have bench jewelers in them. Uh, like I say, it's, it's a trade that has been lost for a time period there. Uh, why, I don't know. Uh, the, the industry outpaced itself is what it did. They outpaced itself by opening more stores and not having enough people to really do the bench work inside of it. Um, a lot of jewelry stores now, instead of doing repairs on things, they'll scrap it out. If a ring comes in and it's broke, instead of repairing it, and it's one that they've sold the customer, to them it's more advantageous to take the ring apart, scrap the gold out, and reuse the stones again. It's cheaper than keeping a bench jeweler on the premises to repair them. So a lot of the jewelry stores, when you get stuff back that's been broken, they just they toss it. It's not tossed. Like I said, it's recycled. Um, jewelry is one of the original recyclers. Um, they've done it for centuries, uh, as far as that goes. But that's later on I wanted to talk about when we talk about the history of jewelry. Like I said, as, as far as the trade changing over the years, um, it, it has changed dramatically. It's changed dramatically really in the last 10 years. There's been a large 
influx of individuals in this country who have more disposable income and they're buying jewelry. Uh, the jewelry trade has tripled almost as far as sales go in the last 10 years. Uh, it's amazing, I saw some of the statistics a while back and they were mentioning the amount of jewelry stores versus bench jewelers. Um, there's actually 20,000 fewer jewelers today, bench jewelers, I'm referring to the people who do the bench work that I do, than there was five years ago. But yet there's triple the amount of jewelry stores out there. Um, they just haven't kept up with the amount of people out there to do the work. Uh, you go into jewelry stores a lot of times now and it's a week to two weeks to three weeks to have repairs done. Custom work, you can talk in the months even, uh, because there's very few custom shops that do casting. Uh, like I say, one, that's one of the techniques I do where you make the ring from scratch. It's completely made, a completely custom made ring. There's places in Chicago that do it. Um, very few in Chicago though, and most of them, same thing. You're talking a couple of months sometimes to have custom pieces made, because there's such few people out there to do the work. I guess I'd like to start with the history of jewelry to start things off. Um, I'm a big history buff. I've always liked history, so when I look at jewelry, I look at it in a historical perspective. A lot of times I'll look back and I'll read things in history, and if I read something in that history book where it talks about jewelry, that, that catches my eye. And I'll really go into it in detail and look, you know, and I'm one of those people that sits there and ponders, you know, well, why did the people do this? You know, why did, why did people in ancient times start wearing jewelry? Uh, some of the stones that originally were used as jewelry were not used as jewelry initially. Um, jade, for instance. Jade was originally used for making arrowheads. It's a very hard stone and it holds a very sharp edge. Opals also, believe it or not, there's been a couple opal arrowheads found in Australia. Opal is another one of those stones that is very hard, sharp edge, and so it made very good points. Well, from there, you can just imagine, you know, what people did, or you can speculate as to what people did with those pieces of jade that they found to use as basically weapons. Uh, spearheads, axes, the, some of the, the jades, um, jet, which is another stone, um, obsidian, which is another black stone that they use for making arrowheads. Very high sheen to it. So, I, to me, that's the point in origin where jewelry started. It's, somebody saw it, made an arrowhead one day and said, you know, this thing looks pretty nice. Well, let me just put it on a string and put it around my neck. Who knows? I mean, people can speculate as to how they started wearing it. That's my theory on some of the things. Um, one other thing that they used to use jewelry for that converted back into jewelry was originally it was used as armor. Um, you've seen old, I've seen old uh, prints and stuff of uh, like Roman gladiators and stuff. Well, even when they were not in battle, they were highly decorated. The arm guards that they used to wear, they were wristbands. Now, maybe that's where bracelets originated. Uh, I don't know. I've never heard it mentioned before. I'm one of those people that sits back and speculates sometimes. And you wonder, maybe people started wearing bracelets originally to wear as guards to protect their wrists when they're in battle. From there, uh, anything that people wore, they started to enhance the way it looked. Um, they decorated it, they added stones to it. People found stones and, and started using those, pretty stones. Well, let me take this little stone, let me apply it to this metal somehow. So they started putting stones on metal. As to when they started doing this, uh, no one really knows. Uh, the time periods that they stopped or started using it, they can speculate, but still they don't know exactly when it all started. They're still finding things uh, in different archaeological digs that amazes them. They find pieces of jewelry. Uh, where was it? It was in Pompeii. I remember reading this article in National Geographic, I think it was. It was talking about Pompeii and some of the jewelry that they found on the people. Well, the reason they could determine that this person was of a wealthy status was because of the jewelry they had on when he died. Um, they found rings on it. And some of the rings that they found were so well preserved that they, they, they saw these uh, different techniques that they used that they thought weren't invented until later on in the centuries, uh, 12th, 13th century, and found out that they were actually using these techniques in Pompeii at the time of you know, the eruption. So jewelry, it's very hard to find old pieces because one of the, like I say, jewelry is recycled. It's always been recycled. Um, and what, what a conquering army did when they went into a country was the first thing they did is they melted down all the gold artifacts that they found and they made their own artifacts out of it. They put their own religious symbols on it. They didn't want to have the symbols of the country that they conquered on it, so they melted it down and recycled it. So there's very few pieces of old jewelry around. Uh, even today, it's very hard to find pieces of jewelry that are from the turn of the century or earlier, because what it did, it got into a shop, if it was broken or it needed repair, most jewelers would just take the stones out, melt the gold down, silver, platinum, whatever it was made from, and recycle it. Same thing with the stones. They would recycle the stones. 
Stones have been recycled for a very long time. Um, I was reading an article about diamonds, uh, and they really don't know the origin of some of these diamonds that they found. Uh, the Hope Diamond is one of them. They know that the Hope Diamond was originally in a rough form used somewhere, and then later on it was captured by some army someplace and sold again and recut. Uh, that's one of the things that they've done with gemstones also. Uh, a conquering army comes in, seizes all the treasures. Well, let me recut this stone to fit in something else. Well, the, cone is, the stone is cut down, or they'll use new techniques that they've learned throughout the century to change that stone to make it look different. Uh, people wore jewelry for a lot of different reasons, and I think that historically you can look back and see that people have worn different types of jewelry. The poor people wore might have wore rings that were made out of braided hair or braided leather. As they went up in status and you got money, you got chains, gold chains, gold jewelry, and so forth. You know? So I think everybody used to wear some sort of decorations and call it jewelry. Uh, they made their own. Um, jewelry can be made out of many different things, and it has been made out of many different things throughout the centuries. Uh, I mentioned the different things that it was made from. Um, the Hawaiians used to make jewelry from feathers. They had some very ornate feather decorations that they used to make, feather necklaces. Uh, it was the material they had on hand. That's what they liked. A lot of ivory was used throughout Africa, uh, throughout India, uh, through all of Southern Asia, really. Uh, ivory was one of the main things that was easy to use, easy to carve. It lasted a long time. Metals is one of those things that I've always looked at, and it's worldwide gold was used throughout history. Uh, the ancient Egyptians used gold, but so did the ancient Mayans. They all held it in high esteem. Uh, one of the reasons they held it in high esteem was because of its easy, easy to use. Uh, and it's corrosion resistant. It, doesn't, it bends easy, it's easy to shape into things, and therefore, you know, it's highly coveted as jewelry. It, they can make it into a lot of different things that they wanted to. Uh, and I mentioned human hair. There, I just started doing a lot of appraisals on antique jewelry, and I've been getting a lot of books and literature on it and trying to educate myself on antique jewelry. And I've been finding some of this antique jewelry that was made right around the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s even. It's called mourning jewelry. Uh, I'm still trying to read more about this. It was basically worn during the time of death of someone. Well, a lot of this was made from human hair. Uh, and like I say, this was in the United States even, uh, this jewelry is, is found. Uh, I don't know yet if it was the hair of the deceased that was in the items that they wore, but it was in there. Uh, There's different lockets and stuff. They had the human hair attached to the lockets, braided down, and then another piece hanging off of it. Um, different amulets and stuff with the hair inside of it braided into a configuration. It's one of those things I'm still learning about uh, myself as far as the different... You, you think you know everything and all of a sudden you find out something else. It's like I say, it's a learning, it's a learning process. You're always going to be learning things. Uh, back to jade again. Um, the ancient Mayans used to take jade and they held it in such high esteem as, as a religious symbol. They used to sacrifice it, basically. Um, I was reading another book, it was, I think it was National Geographic again. They were uh, unearthing a, a site somewhere in Central America, I believed it was. <coughs> Excuse me. And they found a pit. And they didn't know what this pit was for, so they started digging down into it. They figured, well, let's see what's at the bottom of the pit. And at the bottom of the pit, they found all this smashed jade. It was just tons and tons, uh, not tons, but pounds of smashed jade items. And the only thing they could think of is that they were sacrificing this jade. And they found little fragments of it where they were just breaking it up at the site and just pouring it down the hole. Uh, like again, you can speculate as to why they did it. It almost looks like they were sacrificing the jade or giving it up as an offering to someone. Uh, like I said, throughout history in Europe, um, every conquering army came in or a country that came into power, they changed the jewelry that was at hand. Uh, styles changed, they recycled it. So it's, it's hard to find pieces. It, the only time you'll find them is in burial sites. Um, people used to bury their owners with their jewelry. Um, people carried jewelry with them so they could carry their wealth. It was another means to carry your wealth and carry, take it with you wherever you wanted. You wouldn't have to worry about anybody stealing it if you had all your wealth on your own person. Uh, the Spanish uh, travelers, what they used to do is they used to take chains and keep them with them. And these chains were individual links. Well, the individual links were never soldered. So as they went about their business, if they needed some money, they would take off one link out of their chain, hook the chain back up, sell that one link. It was a way for them to keep their money and to keep it around them. They used to keep it underneath their clothing to be discreet. So it was a, it was a means to carry wealth wherever you went. <coughs> I guess from there we can go to the different metals and stuff. Uh, 
the history of jewelry I could talk about for hours, so I'm, I'm going to leave it as is. Uh, gold. As I mentioned, gold is used throughout the world. It, it has throughout history. You can find ancient gold artifacts in the Mayans, the Egyptians, the Chinese. Everybody used it. Uh, the funny part about it is they all develop the same techniques about the same time. That's one of those things you look at and you, you figure, well, how closely were these people related? How much commerce really was there in the world that we didn't know about? How did they trade these ideas? Did these people all of a sudden just learn these all about the same time? But if you look back in ancient China, ancient Egypt, they all developed these different skills and these different techniques in their jewelry application around the same period. Uh, metallurgy is one of those things that you don't know. You don't know how they developed these skills and techniques. How they, they found out, you know, it had to have been through, through trial and error. That's my assumption on it. Uh, gold itself is it's something that is used today still as uh, a means of paying off debt. Um, right now, because of the Asian crisis, gold prices are very low. The reason that they're very low is because a lot of these different Asian countries needed money fast. Well, the only way they could get this money is to sell their gold reserves. Uh, countries keep gold reserves in times of crisis. How much they have, nobody knows. I mean, it's like Fort Knox. Nobody knows exactly how much gold is down there. Other countries are the same way. They hoard gold and they keep it in times of crisis. Uh, right now, there's a lot of gold on the market. Gold has dropped in price from almost $400 an ounce down to $300 an ounce. It's hovering right under $300 an ounce right now. It's been going back and forth between $290 and $310. Uh, but again, it goes back and forth as these crises occur in different countries. These countries are selling off their gold supplies. Supply and demand dictates the price of gold. The more gold that's on the market, the more the price comes down. The more countries start hoarding gold, uh, the price goes up. It's taken off the market. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that's used throughout the world to pay off debt still today. Uh, it's one of those things that I think is going to be moving more into the black market. We are going to go to a cashless society one of these days, I believe. Who knows when? It, it will occur. Well, illegal activity is still going to occur. Well, what are they going to pay things off with? I'm assuming they're going to start paying things off with gold. I, one of the first things I think is going to happen when we go to a cashless society, gold prices are going to go sky high because people are going to start hoarding gold to be able to use to pay things off that they don't want anybody to know about. It's going to be the only means to do it. If we're in a cashless society, what are the things of value you're going to use? It's going to be gold. It could be other precious stones and metals, too. Gold is sold in the United States carotid. Uh, what carotid it is, is this. It's a breakdown of pure gold. Pure gold is 24 karat gold. Now, what they do is they break it down into thousands. Um, to add these different uh, elements to it, or these different uh, chemicals, um, the different metals to break it down. Uh, just to give you an idea, 14 karat gold. Now, if you broke it down into thousands, 585 parts of that thousand are pure gold. The rest of that thousand is other alloys. So you're getting something that's just slightly over half pure gold. So if you had an ounce of pure gold, it'd just be slightly over half of that ounce is pure gold. The rest of it is other alloys. Uh, these alloys are not strictly regulated as to what they use in, in countries. Therefore, it could be 14 karat gold, but the other alloys that are added to it can be different. In India, it can be different in the United States. This can be of extreme difference to where the metal, it can change the malleability of the metal. You have to have the right chemical makeup to make metals a certain way. Um, one of the things that they use for adding to gold to change the color of it um, you, you see white gold a lot, and people look at me and go, gold's yellow. Uh, how can it be white? Well, it is yellow gold. What they do for white gold to get the color, let me see, I got it written down here. Um, they add nickel and zinc. Nickel and zinc are the metals that they add to the yellow gold. If you were using 14 karat gold, out of 1,000 parts, 585 parts would be gold. The rest of the material would be nickel, zinc, and there's other trace metals that they use too. Uh, depending on what they want to use the metal for, they'll add other compounds to it. If they want something that's malleable, something that bends fairly easy, what they'll do is, uh, let's say for an earring wire. Uh, an earring wire you want fairly flexible for the hook earrings because you want it to be able to bend back and forth. So they'll use a compound to make the metal a little bit softer. They still keep the same carrot, but they add different metals to it. The, the metallurgy involved in it has been developed throughout the years. For a pin, like for the stick part of a pin, they want to make that very stiff metal so it'll hold a sharp edge and it won't bend that much. 
So they add alloys to it so it'll make the metal very stiff and very hard. So there's different applications for different types of gold, even. Uh, people look at gold and they figure, the Japanese had a hundred different names for colors of gold, shades of gold that they, they have, that they use in jewelry. Uh, the Japanese have been metallurgists, very superior metallurgists in all fields, uh, metals as far as steels, but also in the gold business and in silvers. They've been very good at the different texturing of golds, too. Uh, they have very different methods of uh, texturing metals to, to make them look completely different. Um, the different metals that they can add to gold to give it the different colors, uh, to get rose gold, they'll add copper. The copper changes it and gives it a rose color. Uh, to get green gold, they add silver. White gold, as I mentioned, they add nickel and zinc. Uh, even yellow gold itself has different shades. Uh, when I buy gold for casting, uh, the company I buy it from, I went to order one day and I didn't have the book in front of me. And I said, well, I need some 14 karat yellow gold. And they go, what color? And I go, well, what do you mean what color? I want yellow gold. Well, no, there's different shades of it. And I didn't know at the time that the company had sold it in different shades. Uh, when I went to order yellow gold the one time, they said, what kind of yellow gold do you want? Do you want yellow gold, bright yellow gold, lemon yellow gold, rich yellow gold, royal yellow gold? And then there's a couple other ones that they had. They're all 14 karat gold but they're all different shades of yellow. Um, you'd have to have them all next to each other to really tell the difference. There's such slight differences in color that you really don't notice it that much. Uh, as I mentioned before, the one thing that, reason that gold has been so good to use in the jewelry business is its malleability. It's very easy to bend. Also, it's ducility, ducility, its ability to stretch. You could actually take a lump of gold, pure gold, and start out with a solid lump and if you had the right material, the right tools with you, you could stretch it out into a mile-long wire. You can, you can stretch the wire. The, the way the molecular structure of gold, without going into big detail here, the atoms are very easy to, uh, to realign. Uh, it can change shape. You can stretch it out. You can actually take gold and press it over the top of stones. That's another good reason for setting it, instead of using set stones. It's corrosion resistant. It's, uh, Pure gold is resistant to all chemicals, basically. There's very few chemicals that break down gold. Um, one of them is mercury, though. Uh, another thing you want to be careful of if you have gold jewelry is chlorine. Now, chlorine doesn't affect the gold. What it does is it affects those other alloys I mentioned. Uh, what this can do is it can make your rings brittle. Uh, this happens to white gold over the years. Um, white gold, a lot of times over the years, will get more brittle. It's because it's coming in slight contact with chlorine. The chlorine affects the nickel and the zinc in the metal. Therefore, the gold is fine. That's stable. As the other metals that become affected by the, the, the chemicals, and that breaks them down, weakens the metal, it can make it more brittle. Uh, I see a lot of old white gold rings that are broken, cracked, and that's another one of those things that gets to a certain point you can't do any more with it because the alloys have been so broken down by the chemicals that people have come in contact with. Mercury is terrible on gold. Uh, I had a nurse that brought a ring in one time and she said, look at my ring. I go, what happened to it? She says, well, she was taking somebody's blood pressure and the machine broke and the mercury went all over her ring. She wiped it off immediately. I mean, she cleaned the mercury up. She said a couple of days later, she went to put on her ring and just broke in half. Well, she, she handed it to me. You could take this ring and you could literally take your hand and break off the gold in your hand. Just break the chunks off. It didn't affect the gold. It affected the other alloys in there. It helped break it down. They use mercury for extracting gold. Uh, it's a very dangerous process because of uh, the contamination of the mercury. It's very uh, closely regulated in the United States. Other countries, when they recover gold, they're not as well regulated. That's why there's a lot of mercury contamination in countries where they're mining gold. Uh, where they don't have strict enforcement of it, they're using this mercury to separate the gold from rocks. While in the process, they're letting the mercury go out in the streams and wherever. So they're not keeping close track of it there. Uh, silver is another metal that's used extensively in jewelry. Um, most silver that is sold is sterling silver. Sterling silver is 925 parts silver. The other 75% can be other alloys. There again, they're adding these other alloys to make the, the silver different uses. If you want stiff silver, you're going to add different alloys to make it stiff. Soft silver, you add those other alloys. So it usually stays right around 925. Um, if you see something stamped 999, that's pure silver. Uh, the reasons for using silver are the same as uh, gold. It's a malleable. It's not as malleable as gold, but it's malleable. It's easy to bend. It's easy to recycle. It's easy to shape. You don't have to have real high temperatures to melt it down either. Platinum. Uh, 
platinum is the magic metal right now. Platinum is, platinum is pure. It's a pure element. Uh, in its state as it's sold, most jewelry, it's 999. It's pure platinum. They leave that one percentage point there for the possibility of other contaminants, and it's just too hard to refine platinum that thoroughly to get everything out of it. So you're never going to get anything purer than 999 in the jewelry stores or anywhere else. Uh, even if you were to buy pure platinum, it's going to be stamped 999 because that's as pure as they can get it. Uh, they're starting to sell some other uh, platinum items out there now that are not called platinum. They'll be, uh, let me see, one of them is called, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that one, Palladium. Palladium is what it's called. Uh, what it is, it's 90% platinum and the other 10% is iridium, is the metal that they add to it. Platinum is a very, a very unique metal. It's very strange It's in its properties. It, to explain it as a jeweler, a bench jeweler using it, it has the same properties as gold. It bends like gold. It's, it's, it's very malleable. It, it's very easy to bend. But it doesn't wear. Uh, the reason I, I, I guess I can put it this way, is e the easiest way to put it, is um, gold, the atomic structure of gold, atoms of gold will break off as you wear it. As you're wearing gold and you brush up against a piece of cloth even, some gold atoms will come off. Platinum, that doesn't happen. For some reason, because of the molecular structure of platinum, the atoms don't come off. Uh, I've seen platinum rings from uh, the Art Deco period, um, back in the 20s and 30s, that people have worn constantly and they look like brand new. It just doesn't wear down. Uh, it can bend just as easy as gold. A selling point that they try to use is it'll hold your diamond in place better. Uh, that's a falsehood. They, they shouldn't be stating that. Because as I said, it's just as easy to bend. So if you had a prong on top of your stone, it's just as easy to bend it off if it's platinum as if it's gold. Uh, that's a falsehood. They shouldn't be telling you that in jewelry stores and they are. They'll tell you it's going to protect your stone better. It's not. Uh, it's not going to protect it any better than gold. The only thing is that those prongs that are on top of the stone are going to wear slower at a slower rate. The one big problem is, is when they do wear, it's very expensive to get new ones on. Uh, it's a different procedure to put new prongs on platinum rings versus gold rings. Uh, a gold ring, you can literally, certain stones, you can heat it up and put liquid gold right on the top of the, the prong. Platinum, you have to get to such a high temperature, it would destroy the stone. So you can't do that process. It's a more expensive process to retip your prongs. Platinum right now is, is very expensive for one reason, the market. Uh, the fashion market has made platinum the price that it is today. Uh, there's no other reason for it. Uh, there's not a shortage of it. There's, it's not in short supply. It's, it's, uh, there's plenty of platinum out there. The, the market dictates the price of platinum, whereas gold is more universal in the pricing of it. Uh, platinum is, is priced by the market. The one thing you have to keep in mind is when you're buying platinum is it's going to cost you twice as much. If you had a ring, two rings exactly the same size, the platinum one is going to be twice as much as the gold ring. The reason, one of the reasons is, is because platinum is twice as heavy. It's a denser metal. If you had a cubic inch of gold and a cubic inch of platinum, the cubic inch of platinum is almost double the weight of the gold. The same volume, but there's more weight to it. So therefore, if you have two rings that are identical in size, one's going to be twice as heavy. Well, when you're selling things by weight, you're paying twice as much. Uh, platinum right now is right around $400 um, an ounce. Uh, gold is at $300. So there's not a big difference there in the price. But like I say, when you're buying a piece of platinum, as far as being made into jewelry, it's twice as heavy. So you're going to pay a higher price right there. Um, the texturing of metals. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Japanese have been very good on developing techniques in texturing metals. The Japanese are one of those people who can't leave stuff alone. They're, they're constantly improving, enhancing, and changing what they have as far as the appearance of things. Uh, gold is one of those things, and platinum. A lot of the new procedures that uh, come out for texturing metals and uh, altering the way the metals look are coming from Japan, uh, surprisingly enough, and the other place is coming from is Germany, another country that's known for its metallurgists. Uh, the metallurgy of the, of the different metals is one of those things that's uh, still centuries old. Um, Different countries have different people that live within them that have been working in metals for thousands of years. Um, gold and silver and platinum are no different. They've been using them for thousands of years and they're developing them. They're still changing them, altering them, adding different metals to them to make them look different. So in the business, in the trade, 
Every year you're getting some new piece of jewelry that's made a little bit differently. It's got different properties to it. You have to learn new procedures for, for handling it. Uh, one of the oldest methods for making jewelry and developing different things with it is uh, called granulation. Um, this was used back in the Babylonian times. There's been some Babylonian jewelry that's been found at the way they use this process. What they'll do is they'll make little gold balls. Gold has this strange property is when it's heated, it goes into a little ball. It'll just go into a sphere. It gets to a certain melting point, it spreads out, and as soon as you pull a torch away from it, it cools and it goes into a sphere. Well, through the years, the trial and error, they've learned, well, they'll take little balls of gold and they make patterns out of it. I mean very small p pieces of gold. Um, they'll just use little circles and they'll put them on a flat piece of gold and they'll make patterns as far as, uh, well, everything you can think of <laughs> they, they, they've done with the, the granulation process. Um, enameling is another one as far as processing, is, is doing th something to metal. Um, enameling is basically you're putting glass on top of the metal and fusing it to the metal. Uh, this got very popular during the turn of the century, the Art Nouveau movement. Um, Glass was one of those things that was used everywhere. It became very popular in, uh, in jewelry. Uh, many glass makers got their start in jewelry. Uh, I'm trying to think of some right now. Tiffany is one of them. Tiffany started out as a jeweler. I think it was mentioned last week. And, uh, he started, Lalik is another one. Uh, Lalik is a very famous glass maker, but he started out making jewelry. And he started out making enamel jewelry. From there, he went even farther away from the metals and went to glass. There's, most of the techniques that are used on enameling are French in origin, or not French in origin, I should say French name. Uh, plaque du jour is the one where they make almost look like stained glass. What they'll do is they'll use a the hollowed out piece of metal on a ring and fill it in with glass. So it has a glass window effect. Um, another one that they use is uh, cloisonne. Cloisonne is where you take a little piece of gold wire and use it to separate the pieces of glass on a ring, a pendant, earring, and so on. Uh, some of the other things that have been used in jewelry are just uh, limitless, even today. Uh, macrame. They're macrame metals. I've seen uh, bracelets that have been woven from very fine pieces of metal, but they macrame it or weave it to make different patterns. Uh, beading is another one now. Uh, arranging beads. Uh, the, the Native Americans uh, were very good with this. Uh, they got the beads from the Europeans, of course. Before that, they used to use shells. Uh, prior to the white man coming to this country and giving them glass beads, which they, they traded to them in barter. Uh, but there again, they were so proficient at beading that they got a new material and they seized it and they used it extensively in their, in their work. Is that me? I'm wired up here. I don't know what I touched. Uh, one of the most famous enamelists, go back and I, I skipped over it, it's Fabergé. The Fabergé eggs, those are enameled pieces. Uh, they're made out of gold, silver, and then the glass is enameled over it to change the, the, the colors and get a whole array of colors. I guess from there I want to go to stones. Uh, we'll start on those. Uh, one of the things I wanted to start on was the difference between lab-created stones. Maybe. Okay, I left off, we were going to start talking about uh, the difference between lab and synthetic stones. Um, there's a lot of synthetic stones coming on the market right now, and there's a lot of different new lab stones. Um, this is something you have to be very careful when you're buying gemstones, specifically colored stones. Um, what they all do is the salespeople will sell them as genuine stone. They'll say this is genuine emerald. Um, a lab-created emerald is genuine emerald. What they do is they're growing these crystals. Um, this technology was developed by the military, basically. Um, they learned how to grow different crystals for uh, different military purposes, for guidance systems and stuff. Well, they perfected it so well that they've learned how to grow gemstones. Um, what they do is they'll have, they have different procedures. Uh, some of them are called flux grown crystals and other ones are called hydrothermal grown crystals. Two different procedures for growing crystals. They'll take the chemical compounds for, say, emerald. They put it in a kiln. They bring it up to the temperature that would occur in nature where that crystal would grow. If they have the right chemical compounds, the right system set up, the right environment, they can grow a crystal of emerald. 
uh, they sell these as genuine emerald. The main, the main thing you got to worry about, though, is they sell these stones as genuine emerald, not natural emerald. You have to be specific and ask them, is this a natural emerald? Uh, then they'll, they'll correct themselves and they say, well, yeah, this, is, this isn't a natural emerald, but it is genuine. You know, if you test it out chemically, uh, it'll test to be chemical. Uh, chemically, it'll test out to be emerald. If you weigh it, the specific gravity is the same as genuine emerald. The one thing that you can look at and find out that it isn't a genuine emerald is the clarity. It's one of those things, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Um, if you're getting an emerald that's choice color, choice quality, and for a low price, it's going to be a lab-grown uh, emerald. Um, one of the main things they use for identifying stones are the inclusions, those small imperfections in a stone. Again, if you don't see them in an emerald, if you don't see them in a ruby, you don't see them in a sapphire, more likely than not, it's a lab-grown stone. You have to be specific when you ask that question, if you see that in, in the jewelry when you're buying it. Is it lab or is it synthetic? Synthetic stones are made from other materials. Uh, it'll be a green stone, it'll look like an emerald, but chemically it doesn't test out as an emerald, it doesn't have the same properties as emerald, so they have to call it synthetic. The lab-grown stones, they'll sell it as genuine beryl. Um, beryl is the main mineral that emerald is. Uh, I'll talk about that later. So that's the one thing that you have to really worry about when you see a ring, if they sell it as a, a genuine emerald, a genuine ruby. Uh, they're doing this with a lot of different stones now. Uh, amethyst I'm seeing. Amethyst is one that's very hard to detect uh, with the naked eye. I can usually detect lab-grown stones in emerald, ruby, sapphire. Amethyst are one of those ones that I look at and go, this looks like the real thing. It, it really does. It reflects the light exactly. Um, all, all the different properties would lead you to believe that it is genuine amethyst. Um, they had a study done one time. They took uh, jewelry out of a jewelry store at random, and things that they were selling as genuine amethyst, they tested them out, and they found it was like close to 20% of the items were lab-grown stones. Uh, the jewelers themselves, like I say, they're not trained anymore in gemology. Uh, they're not really looking to see what's coming into the shop. They're not setting the stones. They're not buying them. It's finished pieces that come into their store, so they rely on the information that's on it. Um, that's one of the things, you, like I say, you have to be careful when you're asking that question. Is it a mistake to buy a lab-grown stone? I mean, oh, no. Lab-grown stones are, are very good. They're very good quality, but you should know what you're buying. Uh, that's the only thing I, I tell people. Um, the quality of it, if you looked at a lab-grown stone, most of the time they look a lot better than the genuine ones, as far as the clarity goes. The color, natural. See, I'm doing it myself. <laughs> Uh, the price comparison, genuine stones, uh, depending on the quality of them, uh, can be four to five times higher. Uh, they are very expensive, the lab-grown stones, and that's because, like I said, they have the same chemical properties and the same refractive index as the genuine stones. So from a distance in the smaller stones, they look like the genuine stone. Synthetic is made from not the same, it's the other chemicals that they use for making it synthetic. Or glass. Glass, silica, silicas, glass. Uh, there's other sorts of different chemical compounds they use. Um, that's about what, that all I can really think about the synthetics. Uh, I'll leave this open for question and answer when I'm done if anybody has any more questions on it. I guess we should go to the main thing. People talk about jewelry, they talk about diamonds. This is the one thing that people know very little about. Um, I, I'm really surprised that when I go and I sell people jewelry how much they don't know about diamonds. Um, that's where we'll start. Uh, get the old projector going here, see if I get this set up right. Diamonds are graded according to two main things when you buy them. One is the color, the other is the clarity. Uh, this is a diamond pricing chart. This is a wholesale price chart. Most jewelers would not like you to see this. They will not show it to you in a store. This is the wholesale price for diamonds. What I have to set it as a one carat stone. We'll just use that as a reference point, a one carat diamond. The colors start with D. Don't ask me why they start with D. I guess they thought they're gonna find some better colors one of these days. But the color chart starts at D and it goes down. As you go down the scale, the price goes down. Um, actually, the best color for a diamond is colorless. Nothing at all. You don't want anything in the stone. The reason you don't want anything in the stone is it reflects the light better. The clearer the stone is, the less yellowing you have, the more it reflects light, the shinier and more it sparkles. 
Uh, that's why the color is one of the most important things. Uh, when I sell people stones, I always try to tell them color over clarity. Uh, the main reason is that these grades that start like IF and go on down are things that are so slight that you can't see them with the naked eye. IF is internally flawless. That means there's nothing in the stone at all. That's the best grade you can get. D is the best color. But you can see the price difference here in a one carat stone. These are all one carat stones. If you had one that was D color, internally flawless, you're talking $13,200. No, $13, As you go down the scale, if you got down to the other corner, it's a one carat diamond still, but it's an I1 in grade and a K in color. Now you're only talking $2,400. When you go to the jewelry stores and they got a sale on one carat diamonds, well, you can guess where it's going to be on this scale. It's not going to be up here. It's going to be way down at the other end. This is what's used for pricing diamonds. When I buy diamonds, I buy them from a diamond broker. Um, my diamond broker that I buy from is called this National Diamond in Chicago, one of, the, one of the oldest diamond houses in Chicago. I fell on this one by accident. It was one of those things that I guess it was, you know, the guys that were smiling down on me or something. I was working in a jewelry store, and the diamond broker who comes in there, I mean, he looks exactly like his title. You know, the whole suit, the attache case, he carries a gun. He's, he looks like a, more like a secret agent than anything else. I tease him about that all the time. Uh, come to find out we were both from the same neighborhoods as, as kids. I looked at him, he looked real familiar to me, and I started talking to him, and by word of mouth, he knew that I was in, a, in the business, jewelry business, and he said, hey, Mike, you know, he says, anytime you want to buy diamonds, he says, just let me know. He says, I'll sell them to you for the same price I sell these big guys, the stones. So I got a source for diamonds, and I wasn't even looking for it now, it was, which was very nice. Um, like I say, you can see the big difference in pricing there. As far as the grades go, uh, the IF is internally flawless. VVS1, very, very slightly included. VVS2, very, very slightly included too. VS1, VS2. SI1 is slightly included, one, two, and then I1, and then it goes down even farther, I3, I4. Uh, there's two grading systems that are used in this country that you should go by. Don't go by anything else. If you ever go into a jewelry store and they try to sell you a diamond and they tell you it's A grade, turn around and walk right back out because they're not trying, they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Any diamond buyer buys underneath these, these grading systems. This is known worldwide. This is a worldwide standard. This is the GIA, Gemological Institute of America. This is their standard. There's another one called the EGL. That's the European Gemological Laboratories. They're all basically the same. Um, there's slight differences. They have like an SI3, where this one just has an SI2 before it goes to the next grade. Um, the colors is the same, though. Uh, the grading system is almost identical. But if you ever go to buy a diamond, you have to ask specifically when you're going in there, OK, I want a, a D color stone, but it doesn't have to be a real good grade. I want a VS2. If you went into most jewelry stores, they would look at you like, well, I don't know, you know, we don't have anything like that. You know, they'd have to go ask the boss or get somebody who is knowledgeable about diamonds. They, they don't know uh, the different grading system. Like I said, this is an international grading standard that you would use. Um, I got this here. Let me change something here for a minute. This is a diamond clarity chart. Um, up in the left-hand corner there is a flawless. Of course, you would look into the stone, you wouldn't see anything at all, no imperfections in there. As you go down, the more imperfections that are in there, the grade goes down. As these here, these are lower grades. They're lower grades because of the different imperfections that are in the stone. The more imperfections in stone, the, the more cracks, the impurities, the more it goes down in price. These are called inclusions. The inclusions, a diamond is, is carbon, pure carbon. Uh, what it is is you'll, okay. <laughs> he wants to see me use that laser pointer, that's all. <laughs> Says they're there for a reason, Dad. Those inclusions in the stone are, they're impurities. Uh, I'd like I say, a diamond is pure carbon, but there'll be parts of it that are not completely formed into a diamond. They're in a rough state. Those are the dark spots. The dark in color in the stone where it goes down on the color scale, is caused by nitrogen. Uh, traces of nitrogen in the stone will cause it to yellow. 
The more that's in the stone, the more it goes down the color scale. Uh, like I say, it goes down into a yellowish color when you, when you go down in that. There again, uh, the thing is that you're looking for these, these, these grades here, like an SI1, by the naked eye, you wouldn't be able to see it. Let me see which one. This one up here in the top corner here. Let me get that down where you can see it. There we go. Uh, that's called an SI1 in grade, uh, slightly included. You wouldn't be able to see that with the naked eye. If I handed you a one carat diamond and you looked at it, you'd be very hard pressed to find anything in there. You need a loop, a 10 time magnifier. Uh, the loops that they use in a jewelry store, that's what they usually are, it's a 10 time magnification. That's what they use as a basis for this. Uh, you have to use a loop with 10 time magnification to find these things even. So those better grades of stone are one of those things that if you want it and you want to pay for it to be able to say I got an internally flawless stone, well then you can pay for it, you know, I mean, it's, 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 that's what you want. And then one other thing I want to show here, I guess we sh I should stay with the brilliant cut stone, uh, the different parts of the stone. This is the most common cut you'll find a diamond in. It's going to be shaped in the brilliant cut. The reason this is this way is it's the most, gives you the most sparkle. What happens is, is the stone reflects the light back in to the inside of the stone. And then it comes back out the top. That's how you get the sparkle. As the light comes into the stone, it reflects off all the different facets and comes right back out. Um, this is really a scientific calculation that they derived this process. Uh, they found out the right angle to cut the stone at. The cut of the stone is another thing that can dictate the price. It's not a big thing though. What it will do is that some stones will sparkle more than other. And what it has to do with is the shape of the cut of the stone. Uh, if it has that proper angle, the right angle to reflect the light, that's what's going to make it sparkle. It's going to have that prismatic effect. Um, a prism, if it's cut, I can't remember if it's exactly a 45 angle that a prism's cut at, a glass prism. But if you have the right angle, you get the rainbow effect. You go a little bit off, you don't get the rainbow effect. It's the same thing with a diamond. If you have the right angle of cut, you're going to get more sparkle. A diamond cutter, when he cuts a diamond, doesn't do this though. What he does is he tries to get the most weight as possible. They'll look at a stone in a rough before they cut it and they say, what's the biggest stone I can get from here? Not can I get the proper cut on it. It happens occasionally, but more times than not, what they want to do is get the heaviest stone when they're done. So the cut of the stone is not that critical to a cutter. He's not going to do that. He wants to get the biggest stone as possible. The cut of the stone developed basically from the raw shape that they find a crystal in nature. I can use this black thing on the board. Okay. Um, a diamond in the rough, the crystal shape is called an octahedron. Uh, what this looks like is two pyramids, butt to butt. That's what it looks like in nature. Uh, I would say 80% of the crystals, diamond crystals that they find in nature are in this shape. It's just the tendency of the stone, it's the molecular structure of the carbon when it's underneath that much pressure, to go into this shape. I don't know why. But you can imagine finding the first diamonds <laughs> without having the technology to cut them. This was the first cut of stone. They just polished the sides as they were. They didn't know how to cut diamonds because they're so hard. So they just polished the surfaces. Well, you can look at the shape of the, the brilliant cut and you can see how it can dictate the cut of the stone. You make a cut here, you almost automatically got a brilliant cut stone. There's very little waste when you cut the stone in the crystal shape. This one here, uh, there again, you flip it over, you got another small, almost identical, brilliant cut stone. There's going to be very little waste when they recut this one to get a brilliant cut. So this is the main, another reason that they use the brilliant cut. It has the least amount of waste. So therefore, they're going to cut brilliant cut stones more than anything else. There again, it, the cut itself hides those little imperfections in the stone. When you've got a lot of facets around a stone and it reflects the light a lot, you're not going to be able to see those little imperfections in there. So it's a good cut to have for buying stones. Um, you can get a little bit less grade and with a brilliant cut, you're not going to notice those little imperfections in there. Uh, up here on the stone, this, the, I'll show you a couple of the different parts. You can see what they are. Uh, the top of the stone is called the table. That's the part you look into. That's like the window as you look into the stone. That's what reflects the light back out. Uh, the, like I say, the different cuts are calculated to be in exact position to where it will reflect the light the best. Um, it's one of the things that's taken into consideration in pricing a stone, but it's not the main thing. So like I say, uh, 
If you were to order a diamond, you can act, ask for that exact proportions, the proper proportions. Whether you'll get it or not, I don't know. You can search for them, but they're, you're going to pay for it if you want to pay for that critical cut, that exact cut. Right now. Uh, to talk about diamonds a little bit, it comes from the Greek word Adonis. It means unconquerable. Uh, the name lends well to the stone. It's very hard. It's the hardest substance in nature. Diamonds are pure carbon. Uh, in comparison to other stones, the next hardest stone is ruby or sapphire on a scale from 1 to 10. A diamond is 140 times harder than ruby or sapphire. So that gives you an indication how hard diamond is. It's used for industrial tools all over the world for different applications. Industrial diamonds are a very valuable um, commodity uh, because they're used so much in different uh, machinery. Because of their, hard, their hardness, they don't wear down. They're good for cutting metals, um, a whole host of things. They actually use diamonds to cut other diamonds. Uh, they use a diamond slurry. It's basically powdered diamond that they put on tin wheels. Uh, and very slowly they cut diamonds. Diamonds are cut a very slow process. Uh, that's one of the reasons they used to be so valuable and so hard to get a hold of. They're primarily found in what they call pipes. Now what these are, diamonds are formed anywhere from 90 to 190 miles beneath the surface of the earth. Uh, the reason is this is the only place that has that pressure that's needed, that extreme pressure and extreme heat to compress carbon into that crystal form. It only occurs at great depths. And everybody tries to figure out, well, how did it get up here? It got here through volcanoes. Uh, volcanic eruption, tectonic plates, the movement of the plates causes magma from deep within the earth to come up. Well, when it comes up, it's bringing diamonds right along with it. Not all volcanoes produce diamonds. They find diamonds in these extinct pipes. They're called volcanic pipes. What they are, they're extinct volcanoes that have worn away. Uh, they'll find these diamonds in them. Um, the Kimberley Diamond Mines is the most famous mine in the, known in the world. Uh, it's in South Africa. It's basically an extinct volcano. And they dug straight down the middle of this thing and found diamonds in it. Uh, it's called Kimberlite, uh, is what they refer to the stone that it's found in. That's what's in these pipes. These are ancient volcanic pipes. Uh, kimberlite and the other type of rock is called lamparite. Diamonds have been a, <clears throat> around for a long time. They've, they've been in use as far as jewelry, uh, as far back as the Egyptians. The Greeks used them uh, in jewelry, but they never polished them. Um, the polishing of diamonds didn't come until later on, uh, 13th centuries, when they developed the cutting techniques and stuff to, to use diamonds. Uh, as I said, the Kimberley Mines is in South Africa is probably the most famous mine in the world. Um, it was opened approximately 1871. Uh, it closed in 1908. Uh, in that short time period, it produced 2,900 kilos of diamonds. Um, this is just one pit. This is one area uh, that these, these diamonds came from. It's probably, the whole area is probably maybe four to 500 yards across and it just goes straight down. Uh, because of mining techniques at the time, they could only go so deep and they had to stop. Basically, the walls were just caving in on them. They didn't know how to mine it at that time. They were just learning how to, how to mine diamonds. They use a different procedure nowadays. Uh, around 1908, uh, De Beers basically is the one who runs the diamond business. Okay? Uh, they had another big find of diamonds, and it was in Nambia. Uh, these diamonds were found in alluvial deposits. Now, alluvial deposits are basically stones that have been washed down river from their original source. Uh, the diamonds that were originally in these pipes, maybe hundreds of miles away, inland in Africa, were worn away by river systems and brought out to the, to the oceans. Uh, these diamonds were found, the, the area was, was quarantined and off limits to the public, and it still is to the best of my knowledge. Nobody can go in there because these diamonds are found on the surface. You can walk around and you can find them on the surface. I've seen a couple of photos that were, was, was released by De Beers when they originally found this site back in 1908. That's another thing that makes me think, why did they stop mining this other one? Well, they found all these other ones on the ground and they said, forget this stuff, you know, we can just go and pick them up. Forget mining them. It was an easier, way to, easier source for getting diamonds. Um, 
they showed that the photo I saw showed these people on their hands and knees just crawling around on the ground with tin cups around their neck. They were picking the diamonds up off the surface and just popping them in the cups. There was that many of them. You could see them in the photo slightly, just in the dirt. They're just, they're just everywhere. The, the diamond business, um, I got to talk about this because it's, it's one of these things that it should be illegal, but it's not. Um, De Beers controls 80% of the world's diamonds. Um, now, De Beers was the pre person who originally started the company uh, in South Africa. Um, he was an Afrikaner, actually, Dutch descent, the, the name. Uh, it was bought out by a family called um, the Oppenheimer family. Uh, back around the turn of the century, I don't know the exact date of it. And what it is with the diamond business is that, as I said, De Beers sells 80% of the world's diamonds. They actually regulate the price on it. They control the price on it. Uh, the way diamonds are bought and sold is a very interesting, a very interesting thing in, in itself. Uh, if I myself had $100 million and wanted to go to De Beers and buy rough diamonds, they tell me to hit the door. You cannot go in and buy rough diamonds on your own. It's impossible. You can buy that other 20% that's out there in the market, but they're going to be inferior grade, and you're not, it's going to be so hard to get them, it's going to be, you know, they're virtually impossible. On the, on the market, you can't go out and buy rough diamonds. They're, they're just not out there. De Beers buys them all. Um, as soon as the diamonds are found someplace, De Beers is there. They buy them out. They immediately go in and they seize control of the diamond market in the area where they're found. They have, they have people worldwide who are constantly on the lookout for mining companies. They survey. They have mining companies under surveillance. So when they find them and they know something's going on, they go in with all the money they have and they buy them out. If you refuse to sell to De Beers, they'll put you out of business. That's all there is to it. They have that much money and that much influence in the world. Uh, one example is the Argyle Mines. Uh, Argyle Mines are in Australia. They do find diamonds there. Uh, this is what De Beers did. And this was in uh, a lot of the trade magazines, so it's not like it's secretive information. They let people know what they were doing. Uh, De Beers, the CSO, the Central Selling Organization, went to Argyle in Australia. This was back in the 80s, uh, late 80s. And they said, you sell us all your diamonds, we'll pay you market price for them, and then we'll sell them on the open market. Well, Argyle said, no. He said, we're going to do this on our own. Well, the problem was that all the diamonds that came from the Argyle mines were smaller diamonds. They're all a half carat and under. Well, guess what De Beers did? They flooded the market with half carat diamonds and under. You could get half carat diamonds and under for a long time or for like a three or four year stretch for a very cheap price. Uh, the jewelers made a lot of money. They weren't cheaper in the store. But that's what happened and they put Argyle out of business. Argyle reopened again. They sell all their diamonds to De Beers now. Um, I don't know if you heard that when uh, Russia was going through the political changes there, everybody's starting to talk about these Russian diamonds that were going to start hitting the market. Well, they never hit the market. De Beers bought them. De Beers controls all of Russia's diamonds now. They went into Russia, they said, you sell us all your diamonds. The Russians started hesitating, saying, no, we're going to sell them on the open market and make our money. De Beers says, we'll flood the market. There's actually more diamonds out there than they tell you. They control the release of diamonds into the public. Um, every year they go through and they see how many diamonds are out there, how much jewelry is being sold, and they say this is what we're going to release. The holdings that De Beers has is unknown. Nobody knows how many rough diamonds De Beers has. The way they release the diamonds, as I said, you can't go in and buy diamonds on your own. This is the way it works. There's approximately 160 site holders. Now a site holder is someone who De Beers picks to buy diamonds from them. Uh, there are different diamond cutting houses throughout the world, uh, India, Israel, there's, they're, th they're all over the place. What De Beers does is they invite you once a year uh, to come into their central selling office in London. They know what these diamond cutting houses use. They know what they sell. Uh, certain diamond cutting houses in the United States only handle big stones. Therefore, as site holders, when they're invited in, De Beers will present them with bigger cut diamonds because they know that this is what they handle. So they go to the different markets and they give them basically what they want. But this is the way it works. You go in, you're invited in by De Beers to the central selling. They give you a box of diamonds. There's no bickering over the price. You pay exactly what they sell you, you're going to pay for it. If you don't, if you refuse their offer, you're not invited back next year. They pick and choose who cuts the diamonds in the world. 
Therefore, they control the whole market. Um, I have a funny feeling right now that De Beers is starting to take over the whole jewelry market in the United States. Um, through reading the different periodicals, I'm finding out that a lot of different jewelry chains are being bought up by this company called Sterling. Um, Sterling Manufacturing is a London and England English-based company. De Beers is also an English-based company. Uh, whether or not this is the case, I don't know. But there's a lot of money out there behind this company that's buying these other jewelry chains up. Uh, as of today, almost f a quarter of the jewelry stores in the United States are owned by this one entity. And they're buying them up faster and faster. I mean, every time I turn around, they're buying another big jewelry chain out. I don't know if it's De Beers. I have a funny feeling it is, though. The way they, they controlled the market with diamonds, they're actually starting to control the rest of the market. They want it all. They want it from the mines right down to the jewelry store. Um, GE, back in the 60s, I think it was, the late 60s, had developed a technique for making synthetic diamonds or lab-grown diamonds. They had the technology. They could do it. De Beers came in all of a sudden and bought out the whole operation. Paid an undisclosed amount, closed it all down. All, everybody lost their jobs, the plant closed, it was over with. Uh, now what's happened with it at that point, I don't know. There's still people out there trying to make synthetic diamonds or lab-grown diamonds. They still haven't perfected it. The Russians are starting to make some. Um, a reason I know this is I buy my lab-grown stones from a Russian. Um, he gets them from Russia, the rough stones. He cuts them here in the United States in Massachusetts. Uh, we saw him at a gem show in Tucson, and he had a rough diamond. He tried to have a rough diamond with him. He had some synthetic-grown diamonds. He couldn't get them into this country. Customs would not let him bring them in. De Beers controls the import of diamonds. I could not go to Africa and buy diamonds and bring them in. I would be a diamond smuggler. If De Beers brings them in, it's business as usual. So it's, you can't even get into the diamond business on your own, even if you had the, the money, because it's that tightly controlled and regulated. Um, De Beers has its hands in every government in the world, um, literally. They give out large campaign contributions so they can get things politically done their way. Therefore, the laws in other countries that are, regulate diamonds are in their favor. Uh, it has its good points and bad points. Uh, the bad point is that you pay what they sell you. So that's why diamonds are regulated. You can't go to another source and get your diamonds. You're basically going to buy them from De Beers in a roundabout way. Uh, the site holders get the diamonds. They cut them. From there, they go to the different sales houses, or diamond clubs, as they call them. Uh, some of the biggest ones are in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, it's been known for that for years. Uh, some of the other ones are in Israel. There's some other in uh, India, too, some of the big selling houses now. Uh, you have to go there to buy your diamonds. If you buy your diamonds from there, you are in the Diamond Buyers Club. Another thing, you just can't go and join these clubs on your own. No matter how much money you got, you are invited in to buy diamonds from them. You can apply for, to be one of these people in these diamond clubs, whether you get it or not, it's up to them. They look and see how you are in the market and they decide. Uh, there again, they, they do it with the, the interest in mind that they're going to be raising and regulating the price of diamonds. The one good part about this is that you know if you buy a diamond today, it's going to be worth 5% next year, 5% more. The year after that, another 5%. They steadily increase the prices on diamonds. Uh, they do this for the reason of sales. I mean, a person can go in and sell a diamond and say, listen, your diamond is going to be worth this much more X amount of years from now. We'll pay you what you paid for your diamond if you come back and do a trade-up. They can do this because they know good and well that diamond is going to be worth more three, four years down the road. Uh, some of the most famous diamonds, a couple of them. Uh, the Cullinan diamond. It was the largest diamond ever found. It weighed 3,106 carats. The Cullinan, Cullinan, C-U-L-L-I-A-N. It was taken from the Kimberley Mines, actually, in South Africa. It was named after the man who ran the mine. Uh, last name was Cullinan. <laughs> uh, as I said before about these site holders, these people who buy the diamonds and then go to the diamond clubs, uh, they control the prices of the diamonds. Um, and diamonds have gone up in a, a large amount in the last few years. I know this because I do appraisals a lot for people. And uh, just to give you a, an instance of what a diamond has changed in value, uh, a lady brought me a diamond that she had received somewhere back in the 30s. Uh, I don't know, approximately I didn't ask her age. But I guess it was sometime in that time period. Uh, the diamond at that time cost $3,000. Uh, this was a three and a half carat flawless 
decolored diamond. I have never seen a diamond of this quality, and I don't think I ever will see a diamond of this quality. Well, as I said, she purchased this diamond back then. It cost $3,000. The last appraisal she had on that stone was um, $30,000. So she wanted a current appraisal on it. At today's market, that three and a half carat diamond would sell for anywhere between $150,000 and $200,000. Uh, mostly because of the quality of the stone, but also because the price of diamonds have gone up that much. Um, another example is I did an appraisal on a platinum and diamond ring that a woman had purchased back in uh, the late 60s. At that time, it cost $500. At today's market price, those diamonds would sell for close to $5,000. They go up steadily. They are a good investment. Uh, I know people who buy diamonds as an investment. They keep them around. And I asked this one guy one time that came into a jewelry store. He would actually sell diamonds to my boss, the one guy I worked for at one time. And he's not a diamond broker. This guy's in the construction business. And I asked him, says, listen, I said, what are you doing with all these diamonds? I said, you got more diamonds than my boss. And he says, I use them as, as a commodity. He said, what do you mean? He says, listen, if I got to borrow $200,000, I go to the bank. I got $500,000 worth of diamonds and I got paperwork on it. He said, what do you think the guy at the bank's going to say? He said, he's going to give me my money. He said, he's got $500,000 collateral with paperwork on it to prove it's worth that $500,000. He said, I use it as collateral. He says all the time. He says, it works great. I said, well, okay, you know. It's his form of collateral. It's also his form of an investment because he knows that those diamonds are going up. He knows the market. In terms of the commodities market, what would be a better investment? Buying gold at a cheap price, you say, is that how it would uh, Like I say, diamonds, you know, are going to go up in price because De Beers controls the market. No, that's not going to change. I, I can almost guarantee it's not going to change. Um, as far as an investment, there's other things that go up faster. I mean, a lot of stocks go up faster. There's the different commodities that go up faster. Diamonds are regulated. You can almost look at a diamond and say it's going to go up 5% in value every year. It's, it's pretty, pretty steady on that. Um, I don't have it with me, but I had seen some paperwork where it showed the prices over the last 20 years, and they've basically gone up anywhere from 5 to 8% every year, the price of diamonds. So they regulate it very good. Anybody have any questions on diamonds other than that? I can't think of anything else to talk about diamonds. There's, oh, there's a lot. There, there really is a lot to talk about them. I shouldn't say that. Excuse me? Uh, it was a 42 carat diamond, a uh, pear shape, I know that. Um, I can't imagine wearing it on your hand, but it was worn on her hand. That's a, that's a big stone to wear. I know, I'm moving on to colored stones now. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I guess we could start with rubies and sapphires. Uh, they're the most common stones used in jewelry. Rubies and sapphires are the same stone. It's corundum. Uh, that's the base chemical. Uh, the chemical base is uh, aluminum oxide, the same stuff that's in sandpaper. Uh, that's what it is. What it is is it's trace chemicals that are found in there that cause the different colors. Uh, for ruby, <coughs> let me see, which is it? Um, chrome and iron are trace elements that are found in corundum that turn it into ruby. That's what gives it its red color. Those different amounts in there cause the different shades. Um, colored stones are graded number one on color. They don't go by clarity because it's very rare to find rubies and sapphires and emeralds that don't have inclusions in them. They grade them overall. The first thing is color. Uh, the choicest color for a ruby is called pigeon's blood. It's a deep red to a red purple color. Uh, as you go lighter and darker from that shade, the value goes down. Uh, uh, star, star rubies, like they get that star effect, what that's caused by is trace amounts of rutile. This is another metal. Uh, what happens is, is this metal aligns in the stones in straight lines when it cools. The crystals are growing and cooling, and what it does is it goes into a, a pattern itself inside the stone. Rutile, for, because of its atomic structure, the atoms go one on top of another in a direct line. So they form little straight needles. And what they do inside the ruby is they go into a star pattern. It's just the crystal formation of the rutile. But it's the rutile in the ruby, and then you get the star pattern in there. 
Uh, it's the same thing in a star sapphire. It's these rutile needles in the sapphire that cause that. Um, sapphire, again, what this is, is aluminum oxide. It's the same stone as ruby. It's the same chemical makeup. It's those very slight trace chemicals in there that cause the different colors. Sapphires come in every shade of the rainbow. Uh, they come in yellows, they come in greens, blues, reds, pinks, browns, golds, oranges. All these are, are slight trace elements in there that cause the different colors, that cause the different shading. Uh, the main chemical that causes the blue in the stone is titanium. Uh, another metal is vandium. This has caused a violet effect in the stone. It's those trace amounts that cause the different things. Um, one of the most famous regions for sapphire is the Kashmir region of India. Um, when I talk about a cashmere sapphire, it comes from this region. It's a color. It's a certain color stone that's found in that region. They've gotten so sophisticated on identifying stones that these inclusions that I mentioned before, these, these particles that are found in the stones, they're, the different regions in the countries that they come from have these different inclusions. Uh, if I was to show you a sapphire, that, or if I showed a, somebody who was very well trained in identifying sapphires, a sapphire from Australia, they could tell me it was that because of these inclusions. These inclusions might, in here might be calcite inclusions. Well, calcite inclusions are only found in sapphires that come from Australia. I don't know if that's the case, but that's just a scenario there. They can look at stones and they can determine where they came from in the world, actually, just by the inclusions. Not the stones themselves, but it's by those slight impurities that are found in there. I understand what you say, and there's a big differential there. What it is, it's the chemical that causes the red. Uh, it's a different chemical in sapphire that causes the red. Whereas in, in ruby, it is iron and chrome. If you find iron and chrome that causes the red, then it's ruby. If it's iron and another chemical that causes the red, then it's called sapphire. So it's those little different trace chemicals that cause the color in the stone. Uh, someone asked me that one time because there are pink sapphires. Well, there's pink rubies too. So it's just like what distinguishes the two and that's what I had found out on my own. I had questioned that myself. Uh, I guess I'll move on to emerald. Emerald is my favorite stone. It's my birthstone. Uh, chrome is what causes the green color in emerald. Uh, emerald is a base stone called Barrel. Now, barrel with the different chemical traces in it are called different things. Uh, if you have traces of, let me see, what is it? I got it written down here somewhere. Oh, an aquamarine. There's aquamarine is actually barrel. It's the same chemical compound as emerald. What it is is a different chemical in there that causes that blue color. It doesn't have the chrome. Uh, clear barrel is called goshenite. This has no color in it at all pink barrel is called morganite. If you chemically test them, it's all the same chemical compound as emerald. It's those trace elements in there that cause it to be the different colors. Uh, topaz. Uh, topaz is one of those things that I remember because of my childhood. I don't know if everybody remembers, uh, I think it was Avon that sold it. It was called Topaz Perfume. It had that little stone on top of it. I mean, I had a drawer full of them when I was a little kid. I used to take them off my mom's bottle. Uh, the, the choice color for topaz is that color. It's a, it's a brownish apricot color. Um, that's the most expensive variety of, of topaz. Topaz was named on an island that it was found in, in the Red Sea, Topaz, T-O-P-A-Z-A-S. Uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's in the Red Sea. That's where the name came from. Uh, it comes in every different shade also. It comes in blues. It comes all different shades of green. Um, Salmon colored, browns, clear. <laughs> it's those trace elements that are found in there that changes the different color of it. Uh, this is one of the things you've got to be careful about when you're buying topaz nowadays. Um, to get the deeper blue colors, they're irradiating the stones. Uh, <coughs> what this does, basically in large stones, is you're getting out quite a bit of radiation. They've limited it and really regulated it now in the United States. But there are some old... Uh, blue topaz on the market that are highly irradiated and could possibly be dangerous. Um, what had happened, uh, I I'd heard this story, a man who was uh, a gem merchant who was carrying topaz before this was regulated and he knew what was going on. Uh, he had large amounts of these topaz in a drawer next to his uh, 
his bench, his workbench, because they're not a real expensive stone. So he just had them in his, in his bench. Uh, this man developed radiation poisoning from these stones because he had a large amount of them and they were such close proximity to where he was sitting at a bench. Uh, and it, like I say, it's regulated now, so the ones you buy nowadays in the jewelry stores, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, they really don't have, give off any more radiation than a smoke detector. But prior to, I think it was, it was in the 80s, uh, the late 80s, that they had found out that they were doing this. Um, they were also irradiating some stones from uh, their cat's eye uh, that they found recently. Uh, same thing, they were irradiating them to enhance the color. Uh, it's one of those things you have to be very careful about when you're buying stones. You have to ask specific questions from your jeweler. If you're buying jewelry that's secondhand, you have to be very careful about it. Uh, as we go down, there's, there's, there's so many different stones to talk about. I'm just picking out the most famous ones, the most popular ones for jewelry. Um, opal is another stone that is very popular. Uh, majority of it comes from Australia. It's found in other places in the world, but the best opal comes from Australia. Uh, there's different mines. There's different types of opal. Uh, Cooper Peabody is an area that they mine them from. Lightning Ridge. They all had these names attached to them um, because of the different stones come from that area. If you were to look at opal with an electron microscope, what causes the color is tiny spheres. They're tiny spheres, they're little balls, and they reflect the light off of it. Uh, the more that are in there, the more color you get, the more dispersion of light. Uh, the most valuable opal is called precious opal. What it is, is it has a lack of anything else but the opal. There's no base color to it, there's no white. It's, almost, it's also referred to as black opal. Uh, the more white opals, uh, the more color in it, the more valuable it is, the less, the less in price. Uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is jade. This is one of these things that I, I like to talk about it's because it's something that most people don't know about. There's actually two types of jade. Genuine jade is called jadeite. Uh, this is the more expensive variety. The variety that you find worldwide mostly in use is called nephrite. Um, there's actually no jade in China. Uh, this is something that people are surprised to find out. Uh, actually, the, the jade that they've used in China is this nephrite. It's a completely different substance. The only place that the jade really comes from, the true jade, jadeite, is from Burma, or which is called, now called Myanmar. Myanmar? Yeah, Myanmar. Um, jade is very old in its use. Uh, jade is one of those stones you have to be careful about when you're buying. Uh, what they're doing now is they'll sell you something that's genuine jade but it's been enhanced. What they do is they uh, enhance the color of it. It'll be a light green stone that they may get in the lapidary, and what they'll do is they'll enhance it with dyes. They can still sell it as genuine jade, but they might not tell you that the color has been enhanced. Uh, they also do this with lapis, uh, lapis lazuli. It's a blue stone. Uh, they'll take inferior grades of lapis. It's more of a white chalky color. Uh, they impregnate it with color, make it the dark vivid blue. They still sell it as genuine lapis but they don't tell you that it's enhanced. Uh, you have to be specific when you ask the jeweler. And if he can't tell you, same thing. Turn around and walk right back out of his store. If a jeweler's not selling exactly what he knows, uh, I, I wouldn't buy it from him because then you don't know. Uh, you could be paying an, an exorbitant price for a piece of jade that is being sold as genuine jade, and if it's enhanced in color, uh, the price can drop dramatically. Uh, tanzanite's another new stone uh, that's on the market. I don't know if people have seen it. It's a uh, it's a blue color, uh, sort of a cornflower blue. Tanzanite, it comes from Tanzania, hence the name. It only comes from that one place in the world. Uh, this is a stone that's heat treated to get its color. When you find tanzanite in nature, it doesn't have that bright blue color to it. It has streaks of brown in it and streaks of clear in it, actually. It's, and it's very inconsistent in the color. What they do is they heat it to a real high temperature. Uh, when they heat it to this high temperature, it makes the color of the stone change. Um, other stones are heat treated to enhance the color. Uh, rubies sometimes are. Sapphires sometimes are. Um, this all has to be disclosed when you're buying the gemstones. Uh, I usually buy my gemstones from certified dealers, uh, AGTA members, the American Gem Trade Association. These people will not sell you stones that are other than what they say, because if they do, they lose their accreditation. They wouldn't take the chance of doing it. A lot of the jewelry that comes into jewelry stores nowadays, as I said, the jewelers aren't setting the stones. There's nobody really in the jewelry stores who knows what they're buying. They're just getting, taking it out of a box. They put it in a the case. They don't know what's going on. Um, 
One of the things I want to get into is the cutting of stones. That's, and this is something that's very important. Uh, I want to turn this back on again here for a minute. This is something that's very important when you're buying a stone. Uh, what I do when I sell stones, I sell them loose. And there's a reason for this. When you're buying your stones sometimes, it was when you look at it in the setting, there's prongs that sit over the stone. These prongs a lot of times are hiding the imperfections in the stone. You can have a chip or a girdle, or uh, a chip in the girdle of the stone, the outside edge of the stone here, and when you set the stone, if you put the prongs over that, you'll never see it. Uh, working in a wholesale shop, I had jewelry come into this shop from many different sources. I've seen jewelry from very reputable jewelers that have damaged stones in their merchandise. Uh, they do it unknowingly. I really don't believe that the jewelers are selling damaged goods on purpose. Because they're getting it from a, a wholesaler, the stones are already set, so they themselves really don't know. There are ways of detecting these imperfections and finding them. Um, another thing that has to do with this, as far as these imperfections that are in the stone when they're setting them and they hide them underneath the prongs, this is something that happens. You hear about people switching these diamonds a lot nowadays. Um, it does happen. It's, it's a sad state of affairs. I mean, it, it causes the business irreparable harm. It really does. There's a very few people doing it. This is something that happens that I know about and I learned a long time ago. Uh, what happens is a diamond will come into a shop. Now, a woman who owns her diamond, she knows if it has slight imperfections in it. She'll look at it and go, okay, I know when I look at my ring, I see that slight imperfection here. I know my diamond. Well, the guy in the shop doesn't know this. He takes the stone out, he's working on it, he turns it and he puts it back in a different way. Inadvertently, the only thing that's happened to that diamond is it's been turned into setting. And what that does, in appearance, when that woman puts her ring on, wait a minute, that's not my diamond. I know when I look at my diamond, I see that spot there. Something's wrong here. Uh, there's no way to argue the point with the person at that point because they're furious. They know their diamond. You know, you try to explain to them what's happened. That's why one of the things you do that I learned a long time ago, when you take a stone out of a ring, colored stones the same way. You have to put them back exactly the way you take them out. The same thing can happen with these imperfections. They can be hidden in the shadows of a prong. All of a sudden that stone's been turned. Now that little imperfection is out in the open. It's not underneath the prong anymore. A woman sees her ring. Wait a minute. I never used to see any spots in my ring. All of a sudden there's a spot there. Somebody switched my stone. Uh, and this is all that's happened. Is that that it's had that slight change in the stone. It's been turned around. It's one of those things you have to be very careful about. Can you turn it yeah, Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, yeah? How can you tell if you're really uh, One of the things that they do with diamonds now <clears throat> is they map them. They'll actually use a high-powered microscope. And what they do is they'll draw a map like I had up here, the picture of the stone, and they'll put in that map exactly where those imperfections or those inclusions are in your stone. No two diamonds are alike, unless you get the flawless diamonds, when there's nothing in them at all. But even those will have slight variations in the cut and the angles, so there's another way to differentiate them. Um, there's a new procedure that's coming up where they're using a laser to map these stones. What they do is uh, gem mapping. They'll take a laser and they shine it through your diamond, and this light is projected on to a, a screen. The screen is attached to a computer, and a computer takes these images of this diamond, and like I say, no two are alike. And they know that that gem print is your stone. There's no other one like it. You can keep that as identification then. Uh, the same thing with the mapping. You can have your stones mapped by different companies. Uh, the GIA, the Gemological uh, Institute of America, EGL. There's a couple other places in the United States that do this. They'll, they will map your stone for you. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Um, another thing that they're using on diamonds now, larger ones, is they'll take a laser and they'll engrave on the side of the stone where that, that goes you know, what, what that diamond belongs to, the name of the person it belongs to. But what they'll do sometimes is they'll grind those off. And there again, you can't find it. The gem print really is the best one to do, or the mapping of the stone. Pretty much out of time, Mike. I don't think you want to talk about anything up here. I'm out of paper. <laughs> so I timed it pretty well. Uh, anybody got any questions? Are the first stones just something that jewelers decided this time? Uh, I think it's just been through history. Someone attributed a stone to a certain month. I've never really read exactly who was the one who designed this or came about. It's just something that's been there, and I've never really researched it.
on that, uh, you were talking about color enhancement. Some of it is a diamond, some of it's heat. Well, the simple heat doesn't lower the value of the stone. No, it doesn't. Uh, the thing is, like I say, uh, when I go and I buy stones from a gem merchant, they will tell me if they've been enhanced in any way. Uh, almost all sapphires are heat treated. Uh, rubies, not always. Uh, emeralds are never treated with heat. Uh, they oil them sometimes, though. Uh, the slight oiling goes into the, the crevices and cracks and the imperfections in the stone. It's something that's acceptable, but it should be disclosed at the time of sale. Yes? If, if someone were to bring a stone into you, how would you assess whether it was a natural? Do you have any means of uh, Well, with diamonds, uh, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, the first thing I look for are those inclusions. Uh, those inclusions are trademarks. They're something that you don't find in the synthetic stones or the lab-grown stones. It's the best way to identify a stone. Yeah, I'll use a loop and I'll look for those, in, those inclusions in a stone. Uh, there's certain ones that are found in diamonds. There's certain types of inclusions that are found in rubies and sapphires. Uh, another thing is the color itself. Um, it's one of those things I've been in the business so long and I've worked on so many stones that I can see a real ruby and know it by the color. It's just something I see all the time and I notice it. I, I notice those uh, lab-grown stones because the color is so crisp and so, so clear. And then there's all sorts of different chemical analysis you can use. Uh, for identifying, there's lots of different equipment you can use for identifying the stones. Anything else? Well, I